All right. Welcome, everyone. Welcome, everyone. Appreciate you all taking time to join us today for part two of our Don't Put Me in a Box discussion. Uh, hopefully, some of you either joined us a couple of years ago when we had this conversation the first time around and or were able to take a look at the uh, previously recorded session uh, on this same topic. And we have most of our speakers joining us again today. Uh, unfortunately, Dr. Hammonds had to alert us this morning that she will not be able to join us due to unforeseen circumstances, uh, but we know she is with us in spirit. We are also recording this session today, uh, so do be aware of that. If anyone has any uh, issues with it, uh, feel free to uh, disconnect, um, but we wanted to make sure that we record this for everyone uh, so that other folks may enjoy it later on. I'm going to go ahead and pin our speakers when they speak so that we have a good recording. And so, uh, again, I'll just open um, our event up uh, formally. Um, our goal today is to really invite you all into a dialogue. And so we will be taking several um, you know, moments throughout the course of the next couple of hours in between uh, the discussions that uh, we'll be having and, and the folks you'll be hearing from uh, to hear from you, uh, whether it's asking you to engage in one of our um, polls uh, that Dr. Popejoy will be administering, um, or uh, towards the end of our session today, um, we will have about 30 minutes uh, where we will invite you all into dialogue. Um, to hear your comments and your thoughts about what you've heard so far today. And again, if you had an opportunity to listen to uh, the first program a couple of years ago. And so uh, with that, I'm very excited to just quickly uh, introduce um, our speakers again. And then Dr. Popejoy uh, will start with the first presentation. And so uh, today we're very honored uh, to have Dr. David Hayes Bautista with us from UCLA. Thank you, David. Great to see you today. Uh, we also have Dr. Michael Udell, who is hailing from Arizona State University. Thank you, Michael. And, uh, and we do have uh, Whitney Hammock, uh, one of our resident leaders who will be joining us a little bit later. I know she's listening in right now, and we'll look forward to hearing from her in just a while. And, uh, and so with that, now I will turn it over to Dr. Alice Popejoy, who uh, we are glad to welcome from UC Davis. Alice? Thank you so much, Michelle. I'm really excited to be here as well. And um, since uh, Dr. Hammonds won't be joining us, maybe we can work in a few more, uh, a, a few more things. Um, but let me just share my screen here. Can you see my screen? Oops. Okay. Wonderful. So the title of our uh, our presentation today, or our, our panel, is "Don't Put Me in a Box," and we're talking about doing population research with the ultimate goal of equity in science and medicine. So I've been working for the last probably six or so years, six or seven years on the use of race, ethnicity, and ancestry in clinical genetics and in genomics research. Um, so when I first started as a, a postdoc at Stanford, I was asked to start the Ancestry and Diversity Working Group of ClinGen, the clinical genome resource. And um, the goal was to come up with a set of guidelines or recommendations for how race, ethnicity, and ancestry could be used in clinical practice. And I thought this would be really easy. We would just look in the literature and see what people had published on, on, uh, on, on how, how things um, should be used. But unfortunately, when we actually started looking at the, the forms that clinical providers were using, we saw that uh, all of the different forms from the different clinical labs had different categories. So we weren't even talking about the same type of information from, from one lab to the next within the same field. You had open-ended text boxes. Anyone uh, just show of hands, let's see, since we have people on here, show of hands, who, who has... Um, has gone into a doctor's office or gone into uh, any any sort of 
um, official institution and been given a form that has a box that they need to check. Most everyone, right? How many people ha who have had to uh, check one of these boxes has felt uncomfortable with checking the box? Yeah, anyone not know which one to check? Is it always a, a, a head scratcher or is it upsetting in some way? Yeah, because it doesn't make sense, right? It's normal that you have felt that way. It is normal and it is it is understandable and it is expected that the experience of having a whole person have to look at a set of boxes and choose one that describes you or maybe choose multiple um, is, is not actually, um, it's not really scientifically a valid way to categorize somebody or even to, especially not to understand somebody um, and the wholeness of who they are as a person. So when you see a set of boxes like this or in this case circles, and you're asked to check one or all that apply, um, just know that if you don't like that experience, that there are people who are working on um, figuring out a different way uh, for, for this to happen and that um, you're not alone in it being um, frustrating. So, okay. Um, so we, we said, okay, we have a problem. We've got these all these forms with different types of information that's being collected in clinical genetics. Uh, let's try and figure out what people are actually using, because surely they're not using this information in, in clinical practice. Maybe they're, especially we're, we're looking at clinical uh, geneticists. So maybe they have the ability to look at people's DNA and they're looking at ancestry. So we wanted to actually ask people, we conducted a survey and this is published um, in the American Journal of Human Genetics. And um, we ask people who work with patients in a clinical genetic setting. So this is the, the forefront of precision medicine, right? If you use information about a patient's race, ethnicity, or ancestry, where do you get this information from? And 94% told us that the information is reported directly to them by the patient. So this would be that self-reported race, ethnicity uh, question. Some people said that they got the information from a patient's medical record. So they don't necessarily know where it came from. 18% admitted that race and or ethnicity are recorded by another care provider and possibly without even asking the patient directly. So I wanted to take a step back and ask this question. What is it that enables or, or forces or what is it that puts someone in a population group or category? Um, so there are different things to think about how the category or population is defined and by whom, what is the purpose of the categorization? Why is it being asked and how will the data be used? What is the context of asking someone to identify themselves? Where is it being asked, when and by whom? And then if data on the scientist side or on the, the doctor side is are missing, what do you do? Do you decide to assign someone into a category? If so, why? Um, and then what is their position relative to the person about whom they're making this decision? And finally, the part of the research that I've been really focused on is how are the data ascertained? So if it's multiple choice, what are the categories? How many are there? Is there a place for someone to write in their own words using their own language? And I think really importantly, do participants or, or patients have true autonomy, agency, and do they feel safe to identify in the ways that they would if they knew that the information was not going to be used against them. So um, we're probably all mostly familiar with these categories here, these boxes that come from the U.S. Office of Management and Budget and the Office of the President, and the uh, the census categories that are determined by this office um, are those you see here, and there has been an effort recently to uh, revise the OMB categories. There have been town halls. Anyone attend those town halls for the, the Census Bureau? was hosting. Pretty interesting. They, they took a, some community feedback. So we may be looking at the addition of uh, categories for uh, Middle Eastern, North African. There was a large contingency advocating for a Freedmen's category. So a lot of a lot of things going on in this space, but still we're we're looking at at these these very simplistic race and ethnicity boxes that people have to choose, including other. 
Um, and there was an effort in 1993 by the Congressional Black Caucus and the Congressional Women's Caucus who came together and said, hey, we have a problem in biomedical data science or biomedical science in, in general. Um, we are not getting information about most people other than white men. So we need to make sure that we're tracking who's included in federally funded biomedical research so that we can ensure that the drugs we develop and the treatments we're testing are working for not just white men. And, um, but the consequence was that then Health and Human Services is directed by Congress to ask uh, NIH to require that, that researchers who are funded by the NIH be, um, be given these categories and say, you need to tell us who's included in your research using these census categories so that we can track it in a harmonized way across, um, across the federal government and its spending. So um, the unintended consequence of that really has been that researchers have said, okay, well, these are the categories that the NIH, my funding agency, wants me to use to report back who's included in my research. So I guess I'll maybe use these in my analyses when I'm trying to stratify out patients and do group comparisons. So the result is that we have research that is reported and conducted on the basis of separating people and comparing them between these groups. And then what we have, we have results that say, this is what the result is for black people. This is a result that we have for white people, et cetera, because we're using these categories in ways that are not, they were not intended nor designed nor valid to be used um, in that way. And similarly, they're used in clinical care as I showed before. They've been integrated into our medical records, um, et cetera. Uh, but there's no real conceptual clarity around what these terms actually mean, what these boxes are about. So I tried to categorize them in this Venn diagram into race, ethnicity, and ancestry, but it's still kind of a jumbled mess. So they change over time. They're conceptually fluid and overlapping. But when we use things like the UK Biobank resources, these are very popular scientific resources because they have a lot of genetic data. They have a lot of data on people's traits and conditions. Um, again, our, the populations that we're looking at here are described according to the UK census categories, which include white, British, Irish, or other, mixed, and if it's mixed, it's mixed white and Black Caribbean or African or uh, white and Asian. So that's a problem. Uh, or other, again, an Asian or Asian British, which is Indian, Pakistani, Bangladeshi, and other, but Chinese isn't in there. Why is that? Right? Because in the US, we look at this, and we think, oh, well, of course, Chinese is Asian. Um, but in the UK, they have a different social cultural political structure and system. And so for, for their purposes, Chinese doesn't get included in that category. And by the way, Asian, if we are thinking about Asian as people who live in Asian countries, that's more than half the world's population. So how is that really informative for, first of all, anything genetic, but, but certainly anything that we might be interested in um, scientifically? So I'm going to um, ask you to uh, take out your phones if you have uh, if you have them handy, or you could go to if you're on your computer or if you have a computer nearby, you can go to the website listed there www.polev.com/popejoy, or you could just text Popejoy, my last name P O P E J O Y, to the phone number that you see there. It's seven four seven four 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 three five four eight. And all of this, these are all different ways of getting you into a session um, using a system called Poll Everywhere. Now, the data don't go anywhere else other than straight to my computer, and we'll use them internally for our purposes. Um, but uh, but these are anonymous polls, so we're not collecting, we're not keeping tracking any information about you other than what you share. Um, through these, through answering these questions. And you only need to do this login process just once. You don't have to have a, um, an account. You don't have to pay anything or, or set up an account. You just have to enter the session and then you should be able to. So what we can do then, um, and I'll, I'll be asking you this a question uh, and in a moment, and then when you go into the session, it'll be there. I'm going to um, uh, put you in breakout rooms so that you can discuss your answers uh, with uh, other folks in the room. And since we are um, a smaller group, we can come back and, and have a discussion as a large group and we'll just see how this goes.
Okay, any questions? Michelle, I don't think I can do the breakout rooms. No, I'm going to do the breakout rooms. Oh, okay, okay. So one second, we're going to do three. And uh, there'll be somebody in each room that'll be um, jotting down some uh, some notes, just so folks know. So one second. Let's see. Oops. All right, here we go. Let's see, make sure I have one of us in each. I'm going to use Michael. There you go. Okay, I think that, oh, wait. Where is Elliot? Oh, Elliot, you'll have to join your own room because you're a host. That's why I can't see you. Same for me. Okay. All right. Rooms are open, folks. We'll see you in a few. All right. And uh, Elliot, are you going to join room three or one? I wasn't sure. I was going to see which one you were going to pick. Um, why don't you go to room three? Okay, we'll do. And it looks like our room one people are not joining. Oh, I think they did join. Who's left here? Okay, that's it. Oh no, we have Kay, Steven. Kay, I'm gonna put you, you're gonna be participating in room three. Hi, Michelle. I came back because I think it's the session's not live unless I'm presenting. Okay. Well, if they're in their breakout rooms, they can't see the homepage anyway. True, but they also won't be able to. Um... You could put it in the, we can put, we can broadcast it. Yeah, I think if we could just broadcast the question, what word or words come to mind when you think of a population and just have people. What word. Here we go. Okay, people are doing it. All right, let me go to, I've been asked to come to room one. Maybe we can. Um... Hi, Dr. Popejoy. It's nice to see you. Hello. Um, really quick. So I was able to get the QR code for um, um, for the the question, but not everybody on the on my breakout room was able to see it. Are you? Can I see the the link so I can um, share it with my breakout room? Yes. Thank um, you. Let's see. Should I broadcast it or? Oh, that might be good because I know I was multitasking getting ready to. Okay. I'm taking notes. So I wasn't able to um, listen and do the same thing. So I was 
my understanding was I'm taking notes to capture their discussion and then uh, based on the word population. Okay. Is that, was um, that my, it was my understanding, correct? Yeah. I mean, I'm thinking that we should probably just bring people back in and then, um, well, we have some extra time, but we can just go straight into, into Michael since Evelyn's not here. Um, I was trying to thinking maybe I could, um, just add a little bit more in before we go to Michael. Whatever you think I'm here to support. Thank you, okay. All right, Dr. Popejoy, what kind of responses did you get? Okay, welcome back, everyone. Um, let's get this back up. Okay, so let's see what you all said. Okay, lovely. A group of people. That is almost always uh, what comes up in um, when I've asked many people these questions uh, over the years. And it's interesting because we often say population, at least in science and medicine, we say, oh, this, you know, in that population or this population, or we need more, you know, more of people with diver from diverse populations. What does that really mean? Well, population turns out really just means a way to group people together. So I'm curious, does anyone uh, feel like sharing what uh, came up in your discussions of this? Anyone want to share? Um, I could just start off. Yeah. Um, so a lot of us did think about geographical groups um, and of people, and then also um, uh, racial, specifically for me. And then another person brought up a good point that it really depends on the context of, you know, 
what you're talking about. Like if you're talking about a certain program or um, just like what's going on that you need some context in order to decide what the population is. Absolutely, context is super important. Thank you for sharing. Okay, so let's keep everyone in the large group so we can see this and and uh, hopefully um, everyone will be able to join. Uh, let me know if you need um, the QR code again, I can show it briefly. But let's, since this was brought up, let's go ahead and um, have you go to the next question. So what does the word race mean to you? Maybe show your QR code again one more time, Alice. For those of us who may not capture it. All right, putting the link in. All right, so you can click the link in the chat, folks, or you can use your uh, cameras to um, hover over that QR code and it will take you to the poll. I'm using the text. Are they going anywhere? Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. If you're in the okay. session and you're texting, they should show up. There's a little bit of a of a lag, but okay. um, texting or on your computer or on your phone should all work. Okay, so thank you. So we're seeing social construct up top, and I guess you you figured out that you can vote if you're on the computer in the or in the app, and you can actually bring things to the top. Physical characteristics, identity, changes over time. People of of a group of people in America treated a certain way because of the way they look. Identity, flexible, myth, historical concept of racism, identity, genetics, ancestry, to maintain power structures for the oppression of others. Yes. Yes. Thank you so much for sharing. Okay. Now, how about ethnicity? Okay, seeing lots of culture, food, family, culture and geography, values and attitudes. So trying to be more specific than race, but same issues. Mostly is for language, identity. All right, thank you. Does anyone want to elaborate on any of their responses here? Is it hard to distinguish between race and ethnicity? I don't know if my texts are getting through or not, but basically for me, when I hear the word ethnicity, I think of an anthropologist who meets a group of people he's not familiar with. He assumes they're a group and exoticizes them, says, oh, how exotic, they have culture. They have ethnicity. And of course, the anthropologist, is objective and doesn't, of course. Mm. Mm. Thank you for sharing that. That is interesting. The absence of an ethnicity, right? The default. I'll tell us. I'll tell you a story. I was giving a poster presentation at a meeting with clinical genetics professionals and researchers, and um, a white woman. A clinical geneticist came up to me and said, you know, I, this makes me really uncomfortable, you know, and, and I don't like identifying, I don't identify as white. And I put on my game face, you know, how do I, how do I not look really frustrated and, <laughs> and, and perplexed and just get curious, like, 
huh, tell me more about that. You know, <laughs> why don't you identify as white? You know, and she told me, well, because race is a social construct and I don't want to be participating in white supremacy. So I'm just sort of opting out and I don't want to sound like I'm like I'm supporting white supremacy. And so I had to sort of gently explain that the ability to opt out of having a race or, or an ethnicity is part of white privilege that, it, you know, for, for those of us who have the ability to, to walk through the world without being negatively impacted or harmed by our racial or ethnic identity, that, that, that is an element of white privilege. So it's, but it, it is definitely, um, as you say, David, whoever is in a position of, of, of power or privilege doesn't necessarily need to, to, to see what's going on here or, or see how it impacts them. I think it's, it's definitely a salient point. Anthropologists wouldn't necessarily identify themselves as having an ethnicity. All right. Any well, other thoughts on this one? Actually, Alice, I'm I'm going to speed us along just a little bit. Okay. Um, because we've definitely consumed the time that uh, Evelyn wrote. Evelyn. Okay. All um, right. Can we do this last one, ancestry? Sure. Okay. Because we also have the time for Evelyn's um poll question. Okay. All right. Last one. lots of family, geography, genetic heritage, history. Wonderful, thank you. So I've asked these questions, as I mentioned, to uh, lots of folks in different workshops, seminars, lectures, and, and panels over the last few years. And overwhelmingly, we're seeing what we just discussed, which is that population tends to mean a group of people, that ancestry tends to be about family and people's minds and geography and origins. Ethnicity tends to be about culture and maybe grouping people by culture, whereas race is really about grouping people by a social construct, but specifically, I think we just say social construct, and as we just illustrated, that can be kind of a short mental shortcut and not really have any reflection involved, but really what we're talking about is grouping people on the basis of physical appearance and specifically skin color. And this has a very deep and painful history in the United States in particular, but globally, that people being grouped by on the basis of skin color, on the basis of physical appearance is something that goes way back and is almost always about perpetuating or creating power structures and dynamics that preserve um, hierarchies of power and privilege and resources and money. So this the, the legacy of racial classification in the US and, and mostly everywhere else across history to justify things like slavery, oppression, genocide, extraction of resources, all of it is based on this idea of scientific racism or biological racism. The idea that there's something fundamentally different or genetically different about people because of the way that they look and specifically because of skin color. But in reality, and we've known this since the 1970s when population geneticist Dick Lewinton showed us that there is much more genetic diversity or genetic variation within traditional racial groups or categories than between them. So we do have 99.9% .9 of our genomes are all identical, but where we differ is mostly random and is not telling us about differentiation between ancestry groups or racial groups or ethnic groups. And so we have this population geneticist in the 70s telling us that racial classification is of virtually no genetic or taxonomic significance and no justification can be offered for its continuance. So we're still grappling with this. We haven't really learned from it since, as I shared earlier, we're still using these things. And I've been thinking about how race, ethnicity, and ancestry should be used. Uh, and a lot of other people are thinking about it as well, including the National Academies. And there's a, been a recent report uh, released about this, which uh, Michael Udell is now going to talk with us about. 
Great. Just take it. Go for it. All right. Hi, everybody. For the figure. Nope, nope, nope. I'm, I need to share my screen. So Go I'm going to share screen. All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Mike Udell. Um, it's nice to be here. Special thanks to Michelle and her team. Um, hold on. Special thanks to Michelle and her team for uh, supporting uh, this event today. Um, really appreciate everyone being here and look forward to the discussion with you later. So I just wanna spend a couple of minutes talking about this new National Academies report using population descriptors in genetics and genomics research um, and provide a little bit of context for where that report came from, its, its relevance, what are some highlights from the report and where it may or may not take us. Um, so first I wanna show you, you know, the, 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 the word boxes is part of the title of today. And these are the literal boxes, the actual boxes that the NIH has historically used to collect data from different groups. And this is a combination of race and ethnicity um, boxes um, that is used in the enrollment of uh, research subjects or used for the enrollment of research subjects in NIH funded research. Uh, the, 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 the form has changed a little bit. It's an online form now, so it doesn't look exactly like this, but this is the gist of the kinds of questions that the NIH and other federal funders of research or research are asking in the context of um, collecting population like data. Um, so what are some of the challenges of using race and other population concept? Well, one, there's a general lack of clarity and consistency in the use of racial terminology in research. Two, there's a general failure of scientists to distinguish between self-identified racial categories and assigned and assumed racial categories. We saw this in the data that Alice uh, presented just a few moments ago. And finally, there remains a need to justify the use of race and other categories relative to the research questions asked and the methods used. There aren't only challenges, but there are actual dangers um, in using concepts like race. There was a paper in 2016 in the Proceedings of the National Academies of Science um, called Racial Bias and Pain Assessment and Treatment Recommendations and False Beliefs about Biological Differences Between Blacks and Whites. This was a study conducted in the University of Virginia medical system with residents and med students. And what the study showed was um, uh, the present work sheds light on a heretofore unexplored source of racial bias and pain assessment and treatment recommendations within a relevant population, that was medical students and residents, in a context where racial disparities are well documented, i.e. pain management. It demonstrate that, demonstrates that beliefs about biological differences between Blacks and Whites, beliefs dating back to slavery, are associated with the perception that Black people feel less pain than do White people and with inadequate treatment recommendations for Black patients' pain. So in other words, um, historical ideas of race and the association of um, beliefs about pain toleration um, still linger till today in a medical school and, and a, a, a distinguished medical school setting and is having a direct and dangerous impact on patients who are being un, under medicated for pain um, because of beliefs like this. Um, another example was a book in 2014 called The Troublesome Inheritance, which made all sorts of racist and anti-Semitic claims. Nicholas Wade is, it was a writer, uh, one of the lead science writers for the New York Times. Uh, the book got a lot of uh, play out there, unfortunately. Um, but what was interesting about this is that Wade cited the work of over a hundred um, well-known and well-regarded geneticists and, and genomic researchers, but manipulated that work um, in their own work, they had used racial terminology to describe different outcomes in a variety of um, biological and, and social traits. Um, and it upset these scientists so much that they actually uh, wrote a letter to the New York Times who had reviewed the book, um, basically saying that uh, we reject Raid's implication that our findings substantiate his guesswork, they do not. We are in full agreement that there is no support from the field of population genetics for Wade's conjectures. And I should add Wade's racist, very racist conjectures. Um, the bottom line though, is that when racial terminology gets used in studies like this, it opens the door for um, stuff like we see here from Nicholas Wade. And then of course, there's a long history of race correction, which is the idea that clinical algorithms can control for 
so-called racial differences between groups in a wide variety of clinical tests and procedures. Um, Recently, there's been a pushback led largely uh, by a younger generation of physicians, particularly medical students over the last decade, who've been pushing to exclude um, these racial algorithms um, from a variety of, of contexts in medicine. Um, in 2020, the University of Washington Medical Center started excluding race from a calculation of EGFR, which is a measure of kidney function. Um, and in 2021, uh, researchers remove race from a calculator for, for childbirth, that is the, the VBAC calculator um, for vaginal births after cesareans. So real world implications for the way in which race manifests itself in medicine. So a, a lot of us have been talking about this for decades, actually for over a century. W.E.B. Du Bois warned us of this in his books in the late 19th and early 20th century about the misuse of uh, racial categories in a wide range of contexts, but specifically addressed health as one of them. Um, and a group of us starting in 2016 in a paper of science argued that race should be removed from the field of human genetics. We believe that the use of biological concepts of race and human genetic research so disputed and so mired in confusion is problematic at best and harmful at worst. It's time for biologists to find a better way. In this paper, we called upon the NIH and the National Academies to fund a consensus study that the National Academies is, is well known and well regarded to do. They're considered an honest broker in scientific thought. Um, unfortunately, uh, this paper was published in February of 2016. We had a meeting at the NIH in, in October of 2016 with the hope that there would be some change um, and that this would be funded. Um, an election in this country took place uh, the next month, and these these um, these ideas were unfortunately put on hold. Um, four years later, we published a second paper. This time, we had over seventy oh wait seventy signatories, um, where we again called upon the NIH to confront the use of race in science, and we were particularly concerned that explanations for the disproportionate rates of uh, COVID-19 and Black, Latino, Indigenous, other communities of color will mistakenly point to innate racial differences instead of longstanding institutional racism and other underlying social, structural, and environmental determinants. So we again called the NIH on the NIH to fund this National Academy study. There was a lot of silence until um, 2021 in October. Uh, they started recruiting um, members of a committee um, on using population descriptors in genetics and genomics research. Um, and that group began its work in early 2022 and completed its work in March of 2023, 17 members from across disciplines. Um, and it's really a, a groundbreaking report with some challenges that I wanna talk about over the, the, the couple of minutes I have remaining. So the charge of the report was to conduct a study to review and assess existing methodologies, benefits, and challenges in using race, ethnicity, ancestry, and other population descriptors in genomics research, 17 members from across natural and social scientific disciplines. I told you when they did their work. So it's an important report. It's over 100 pages. It is worth reading if this is an area of interest to you, which I suspect it is because you're here joining us today. And you can download it for free. Um, on the National Academy's website, and I'll plunk that into the chat box after I finish this. Um, but the, 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 the talk has, I'm sorry, the, the report has 13 recommendations, including guidance on how to study and describe human populations, the role that study participants and community partners should play in the selection and use of population descriptors, and the roles that funding agencies and scientific institutions should play in operationalizing and supporting the committee's recommendations. So here are some examples of the recommendations. Examples one, two, and three, I think are the core of the report. Um, one, researchers should not use race as a proxy for human genetic variation. In particular, researchers should not assign genetic ancestry group labels to individuals or sets of individuals based on their race, whether self-identified or not. Two, when grouping people in studies of human genetic variation, um, researchers should avoid typological thinking, including the assumption and implications of hierarchy, homogeneity, distinct categories or stability over time of the groups. And three, researchers as well as those who draw on their findings should be attentive to the connotation and impacts of the terminology they use to label groups. There are other recommendations that re re revolve around who should fund this, that uh, 
research should be conducted in an interdisciplinary manner on these subjects. So it shouldn't just be geneticists um, studying genetics issues in the context of health disparities in particular that often have, well, that all the time have um, environmental, um, political and economic aspects, other health determinants. Um, and there is a really useful um, uh, flow chart in the back of the report um, that this summarizes here about when you should and shouldn't use certain categories. Um, and I'm not gonna go through this in detail, but as you can see in the first column here, uh, race is, is recommended not to be used in genetic studies, except when studying health disparities. Um, and even in that context, um, it's, you know, talk, it, it's, it's only to be used as a proxy for environmental effects. So I would argue that the term racism is more appropriate here, but that's that we can pick up in discussion. So what are the report's limitations? Well, a report is just a report. You know, this could sit and gather dust for centuries. As, as the historian, I can tell you there are other reports that have been issued over the years that are somewhat like this one. Um, the, the, the question of how this report will be operationalized is key at the moment. Um, I was on a call with NIH two weeks ago and they're definitely thinking about this. Um, what they will do remains to be seen. I know they're having um, the reports, uh, the, the committee's chairs come and talk to NIH uh, this month, I believe, I mean, next month, I believe. So hopefully that something will come, about that, come out of that that's positive. Um, the reach of the report is narrowly focused on genetics and genomics. It doesn't talk about medicine. It doesn't talk about social science research. It doesn't talk about interdisciplinary work. Keep a key point that's important, I think, for us to discuss is the lack of community engagement in the report's development continues to foster a gap between science and society. They had some open sessions, but the community that they engaged were other scientists. It wasn't the public. Um, unclear still how the scientific community is reacting to the report. And the report fails to acknowledge that the concept of race is deeply rooted in the history of eugenics. And in fact, that modern biological notions of race were developed by eugenicists and geneticists. I think this is key. It tries to whitewash that history a little bit, which I found trouble. Anyway, love to hear from all of you and to continue the discussion and I will stop there. Thank you, Michael. So we do um, want to take these little breaks, as we said, uh, to be a bit interactive. Um, so maybe, Alice, you you could share your question. I wasn't sure uh, how much extra time Michael would take, but I do think we have a moment to um, go ahead and engage folks in a in a poll. And again, if you know folks have questions or comments or thoughts, you can feel free to put them into the chat as well. And this is for the uh, the same link you were using for the poll. You may need to put the link back in here again, Alice. Maybe you folks could share verbally as well, just any ideas. Yeah, I think holding the Zoom and community town halls is, is good. It took us a couple of years to get back to this one. The first one was during COVID. And of course, there were tons of people because everybody was, was stuck to their devices and, you know, experiencing the world through our screens. Um, times have changed again, uh, which, of course, is why we'll, we're recording this and, and we'll share it widely. Um, but it is harder now, um, you know, getting folks uh, to show up to virtual and in-person things these days. it's It's been an interesting transition the last couple of years, and I don't know if we're quite where we're supposed to be yet and how we're showing up in the world these days.
Awesome. Was there another? I, mean, I, I will just jump in and say that this is this is a major hole in that report. Um, that you know when when I saw the original agenda for the year, it included community engagement, but the community engagement turned out not to be community engagement. It was really focused on you know soliciting other scientists' opinion, which I think is fantastic and it needed to be done, but not engaging with communities who have been impacted by these types of ideas and terminology is not good. I'll leave it at that. Any other thoughts or questions at this point before we turn it over to Dr. David Hayes Bautista? Thank you, Anissa. All right, David. All right, Let's see if I can share my screen here. That's always a bit problematic. Okay, actually, then I'd like to um, reference a paper that uh, Alice and Michael and I co authored uh, on this very topic about the OMB categories. But I want to point out that uh, part of our conclusion, and let's build on Michael's comment is we wanted to provide a framework for including the voices of racialized communities. I mean, we know how the white scientific community thinks about race. How about the racialized communities? How do we think about race? Well, given that this is so hardwired into the way that science works, the um, metrics that matter for population health said very clearly, the primary drivers of poor health outcomes are race and poverty. And race was defined by the IOM as an innate individual trait, that is innate. You're born with this race, back to that biological sort of thinking. So the census in 2020, and it happened early in COVID, so people had a lot of time to really think about their responses. If you remember, everyone was asked your ethnicity and there are only two ethnicities. You're either Hispanic or you're not. So Irish doesn't count, Italian doesn't count. A lot of things don't count. Either you're Hispanic or you're not. Then everyone is asked, okay, whether you are or aren't Hispanic, what's your race? And this question, second question about what race really baffled Latinos. So we've been doing some uh, field work on this. What did, how did Latinos, what went through their minds when they were asked these two questions? And these are responses uh, directly from some um, focus groups and reflection statements we've been collecting. So the first question, are you Hispanic or are you not? As this one person said, when the question asked for my ethnicity, if I was Hispanic or not, that was a simple response for me to select without an issue. And many have said, even if I don't speak Spanish, I'm Hispanic, I don't have a Spanish surname, I'm, not, I'm still Hispanic. I was born in New York, not in the Caribbean, I'm still Hispanic. I don't like jalapenos, I'm still Hispanic. So there could be a lot of looseness. Nonetheless, we recognize our ethnic affiliation as Latino slash Hispanic. Although they did comment, choosing ethnicity is easy because I know to choose Hispanic or Latino, despite there being its own confusion with the debate on differentiating Hispanic versus Latino versus Chicano versus Boricua versus Salvatrucha and all of that. Nonetheless, we know we're Hispanic. But then Latinos were asked, what race are you? In my personal experience, my race is the most difficult for me to answer and pinpoint because I could never identify to any race. When filling out the ethnicity portion, he, the discussion partner, did not question himself or have trouble answering, i.e. Hispanic. But when questioned about his race, he explained he could not identify with any of the races listed. And that was your typical OMB set of races. For example, in the census, we often found ourselves going through the options and reflecting on which race we could relate to the most. Are we more like African-Americans, Native Indigenous, Whites, Other, 
This was really a baffling question for Latinos. So many Latinos, many respondents talked about, well, they had to find out. They wanted to make sure they answered correctly. So some of them would Google. When we were completing the census last year, I ended up Googling them to see the technical definition and see what category we would best fit into. And of course, they got that gobbledygook of the OMB category, but they were trying. Sometimes they ask an authority figure. At my current job on our student applications, we have a section for race and ethnicity. Our students would ask, what do I put down here? And I would not know what to say. This informant, by the way, was a Latina herself, but she didn't know what to tell them. But students would ask her, what, how do I respond to this question? And sometimes they're told, you are this race, select that race. Some said that when they go fill out a paper and when it says to choose what race they are, they end up picking the one they are told to. This is really important. They end up picking the one they are told. Many people told, you are this race, you're that. Put it down on the form. In the airport, TSA gave her a race ethnicity card to fill out. And not being able to identify with something, she chose white. And the TSA officer said, you're not white. And the girl said, I'm not black either. Okay, so this is really is confusing. There is a very emotional question for a lot of Latinos. It brings up stereotype threat and everything else when it's asked as you're sitting down to take the MCAT or the SAT. So that sometimes Latinos choose not to respond to that question, which of course blows your internal validity all the heck. I am not Native American enough to say I am but that I am also other races. For this, I indicated I rather not identify my race. They'll often skip over that question. Many times when it was a written or fill in the blank form, I was able to just leave the race question blank and just select my ethnicity. Of course, there are algorithms for bridging races to people to do that. And then of course, there's the issue of what about the kids? I had to register my son for middle school and it asked his race and ethnicity. Well, I am Hispanic, my husband is not. So are they Hispanic enough to fill in that bubble? Okay, well, <clears throat> some even would refer to their 23andMe test. I took a DNA test through 23andMe. On my mother's side, Hispanic, it all came out that not only am I Spanish descent, but I am also Native American, Mayan, Asian, various, mainly Siberian and Chinese, African, Moorish descent, and Arab descent. Whoa, can we put this person in a box? The solution given by yours truly is the best. We are Indo, Afro, Oriento, Ibero, American. At the same time, I am 100% Puerto Rican, a multicultural race. Now, somebody's very proud to be uh, Latino. Okay, so here we're seeing a conflict of racial narratives. There's the dominant US narrative that's hard-edged and binary, or we try to make it so, as we have seen from the previous two presentations. For example, when we array data the way we did in this chart, this is from the California Healthcare Foundation of births in 2014, it, uh, by race, ethnicity, either Latino, births, white, Asian, African-American, et cetera, we sometimes unwittingly or unthinkingly reify, or appear to reify, the idea that race, these racial categories are natural divisions that we as researchers simply observe what nature has created, simply observe and record that they are mutually exclusive, that no Latina is ever white, no white is ever Asian, no Asian is ever African American. They're just totally, completely mutually exclusive, that they are internally uniform in some fashion. All Latinas are alike, all whites are alike, all Asians are alike, all African Americans are alike and that they are permanent and unchangeable. Remember, innate individual characteristic, you are born with this race, you live with this race, you die with that race. And of course, as Alice and Michael both said, but that's not the way the world is. We don't live in these exclusive racial lanes. I've been really curious about operationalization of these racial categories, their definition. As I go back to the code books, as Alice was pointing out, uh, if we look at the hospital registries, every single registry, be it the knee and joint replacement or the uh, heart failure plus shock registry, whatever it might, they have 
different numbers of categories. They are defined differently. They're operationalized different. So I've been looking at the question, what makes a non-Hispanic person either white or black? So I take that back to the 1790, the very first census. And we have to remember why these categories were created. In the very first census, they were created to deny full citizenship to those who are not white. So you needed to know who was black and who was indigenous. And from 1790 to 1970, the enumerator was the one who made that decision. For example, in the 1930 census, the enumerators were told that a person of mixed white and Negro blood was to be returned as Negro, no matter how small the percentage of Negro blood. So that gets us to the one drop uh, sort of um, thinking. But how was this operationalized? You know, I was originally trained as an engineer. So for me, this should be fairly simple. First of all, if you're saying one drop of black blood makes someone black and not white, I need to know what is the difference between white blood and black blood. And the census bo never bothered to explain that difference. Secondly, the enumerators never drew any blood samples because, you know, as a researcher, you'd want to find out, is this person white or black? Draw a blood sample. And of course, they were never sent off to any lab for analysis. So how was a person's race defined? The enumerator looked at the person and made that decision for the person up through the 1970 census. So I would ask, was this science, really? Or was it just the local racial narrative being utilized to fill out a census form? Nonetheless, after 230 years of this, I think people have kind of got the drill. And in the 2020 census, nearly 95% of those who have said they were not Hispanic wound up describing themselves by a single race category. About almost three fourths were white, about 15% were black, they were American Indian, they were Asian Pacific Islander. Very few, less than 1%, they said they were some other race. And 5% said, well, I'm two or more of these categories. Okay, what race are Latinos? I mean, this is confusing to Latinos when we're asked this. We know we're Hispanic, but then you ask the race. My gosh. Well, the same thing applied from 1790s to 1970. The enumerator was given instruction, again, for the 1930 census. Practically all Mexican laborers, notice the class that is woven in here, laborers are of a racial mixture difficult to classify, though usually well recognized in the localities where they are found. Wow. Where was the science in that operationalization? Because basically you're just reifying the local racial narrative. Now, from 1980 to 2020, the enumerator no longer made that decision. Rather, people were given these categories and they could volunteer to define their race ethnicity. OMB defines Hispanic or Latino as a person of Cuban, Mexican, Puerto Rican, South or Central American. Now those are all, you notice geographies. They're not anything you can consider like DNA or even culture, single culture, or other Spanish culture or origin regardless of race. That is a very loose description if we're trying to pinpoint. So Latinos have no problem saying, I'm Latino, Hispanic, Mexican-American, Chicano, Puerto Rican, Cuban, whatever else, but ask this race question. And in the 2020 census, three fourths of Latinos were not able to describe themselves as fitting any single race category. And in fact, the response pattern was, in the 2020 census, 20% of Latinos said they were white. But you have to remember, when a Latino says white, they don't mean what the Aryan Brotherhood means by white. The, often to them, it means I'm a citizen, uh, I'm middle class, whatever. I, I'm an American, so I must be white. Very few said they were Black, Asian, or American Indian. And nearly three, four said, I don't recognize these cats. I must be something else. Nonetheless, in science, quote unquote, we use this race ethnic combination as if they had some meaning. The primary drivers of poor health outcomes are race and poverty. So we look at this life expectancy table from the uh, 2016 
NCHS uh, book. And so here we're looking at the not Hispanic or Latino population, the, those who are white, that's the non-Hispanic white, non-Hispanic black. Then here are Hispanic or Latino, they've been separated out. So in theory, we have three different groups here. But when you go to the uh, foot of the table, the explanation here, persons of Hispanic origin may be of any race. Well, wait a minute. One drop makes the difference between white and black. And we have built our entire research apparatus on this assumption for 230 years. Then the other half of the population in California, suddenly it doesn't matter, doesn't, doesn't apply. King's X or something. Uh, persons of Hispanic origin may be of any race. And as I often read, continue, and we usually are of any race. So why this one drop distinction here and suddenly for this group doesn't matter. So as we look at births in California, if race have, has any predictive power, but then we're leaving out half the population, our internal validity is completely shot. Completely shot if Latinos may be of any race, but everybody else has to be of one. And Latinos say, by the way, I'm kind of all of the above. Um, I mean, that's, we've really kind of come to the end of using these categories in any meaningful way in the increasingly multicultural, multiracial population and racially ambiguous population of the United States. So I just want to bring this back to that earlier question. And this is not a new question, by the way. This is a, an article published in Spanish here in Los Angeles in 1876. Uh, by Manuel M. Corella, who, by the way, graduated from UC Berkeley in 1870. He's one of the first graduates, and he was on the faculty. But here he was traveling in Mexico, and Mexico City, for the first time in my life, I was asked, to what race did I belong? So he's sharing his thoughts here in this newspaper column published here in Los Angeles. So he wrote, 1876, I realized from my hair that the cradle of at least a half a dozen of my ancestors had been rocked on the west coast of Africa. There's your Afro part. I found out from my face bones, narrow forehead, and snub nose that my ancestors had been none, or, none other than the same as Cochise, the formidable chief of the Apaches of Arizona and Sonora. Indo, Afro. And to finish, my skin color advised me not to travel to Puerto Rico until slavery has been abolished. It's 1876. So this has been part of what I have seen. Latinos have been baffled by the racial categories used by the U.S. ever since the 1850 census in California, don't see themselves reflected in it, do see themselves as somehow having something in common with others who raise their hands and say, yes, I'm Hispanic, even though it can speak different languages, eat different foods, et cetera. There's something there that coheres and is uh, we pointed out in the paper, does tend to have some health results, but clearly this is not biologically driven. So with that, I will stop the share and just open it up for thoughts, comments, questions, feelings. Thank you so much, David. I know that Alice has another poll for us, so we're going to pop that up, but you know, please feel free to answer the question um, and you know any comments or questions that you might have for David for the next couple minutes before we jump into our, our next conversation with Whitney Hammock, one of our community leaders. Ludicrous is a good word for it, Anissa. <laughs> Makes no sense. At least not to us. <laughs> Unfortunately, it makes really good sense to people who use all of these things uh, to our disadvantage.
I was a little curious to hear from folks um, in our breakout room, we talked about the census. And um, of course, there's always a lot of emphasis put on the importance of being counted. Um, but in light of some of what we've been learning today about the origins of those counts and how that information um, you know, has been used to harm us and uh, is, is likely uh, often still used in some harmful ways, are there any other thoughts people have about that as an example of how we are categorized today? Well, I, I must say, I have a number of colleagues who are from the Middle East, and they say they want their own category in their system. I say, wait a minute, be careful what you wish for. They were not put there to help you. Now, I know now the Census Bureau spends, they use the race ethnic categories to help the groups. But for the first 200 years, they were there to set apart and exclude. That is why they are there. Please don't wish to get into that game. There are other ways to find out what we need to find out. Let's not use that epistemology. Exactly. Mm. It's a great question. What are you all trying to accomplish by engaging communities? Let's, let's open that up to David, Michael, or Alice. I think that's a great question. Well, if I can just jump into this, what we explained in our paper, uh, the whole point is, okay, we know the dominant racial narrative. Other communities, the racialized communities, what's their experience? How do, what, how do they put the world together? And I think there will be very different epistemologies about how you describe human samenesses and differences. But we need to get those voices present at the table. And not just in a consultative matter, they need to be part of the PI structure, part of the research structure. Bring those subaltern racial narratives into the research labs, my counsel. If I could jump in and add to that, David, and David, thanks for the great, great talk and the, the, the walk through this really um, complicated but incredibly relevant history. Um, I, I think Another reason that community engagement in this context is important is that science is being done in the name of communities, particularly communities of color, as we are trying to study health disparities, which are a real thing. We know they exist, but are we studying them in ways that are actually harming those communities and um, you know, ultimately not addressing what is is trying to be understood. And, and I think having that dialogue with communities can shed light on, on a host of, of challenges and misunderstandings um, and inform the way scientists um, often think in what, in my opinion, is, is the wrong way about both difference and similarities between populations. Uh, and I, I have something else to add. I think community input in the research, and I am not a researcher. I work for Plant Parenthood Los Angeles, but I, I sit in a um, IRB for UCLA. Um, I think it's so important, the community input, when uh, the PI is putting together a, 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 a project of research, because I think the community have, have more of the experience that they can bring out and um, highlight some of the needs that are there when um, we're thinking about research. I can briefly share that, and I'll, I'll share at the end, but to answer the question, for me, doing community outreach and engagement on the research that I'm doing to try and develop methods to get rid of the boxes or to supplement them with open-ended ways of responding is about respecting Indigenous data sovereignty and the right to self-identify. It's about understanding what people really want and what the concerns are so that when I'm building the methods, I'm building in systems and structures that protect people's privacy and that address the concerns and the desires that people have for the types of tools that we could be using in science that are trustworthy, um, rather than focusing on how to get communities to trust researchers. I think researchers first need to be trustworthy and build trustworthy systems and structures, but we can't do that without feedback and input in the design from community members. In a nutshell. Mm. 
All right. It is no longer taught. And that is exactly, uh, Tony, a great segue into our next conversation with Whitney Hammock, who is uh, a member of the Compton community uh, here in LA County, as well as a member um, of our Rising Communities organization. Um, prior to joining us actually as a team member, uh, Whitney was on our elected resident task force. So she was elected by her peers to serve on our regional task force uh, with the first five LA Best Start communities and um, helped with participatory grant making, allocating funding to organizations, um, and just really uh, being a tremendous advocate uh, for her community and, uh, and the families um, that are her neighbors and friends as well. And so with that, uh, I wanted to invite um, Whitney to join us. Are you here, Whitney? There you are. All right. And I think- there is, I'm here. Yes, there she is. Awesome. Thank you so much, Whitney, uh, for joining us. And you know, part of the conversation that um, that Whitney and I wanted to have with you all today was to sort of bring it back down onto the ground, right? In community, um, uh, Dr. Popejoy, uh, Dr. Uh, Hayes Bautista and Dr. Udell are, as they said, they're they're in the labs, they're, they're speaking from on high and they are often lone voices in the wilderness <laughs> in a really structurally racist system of racial categorization. And so we want to, popularize the conversation, right? We want this to be a mainstream conversation where all of us on, on the ground who may not be in those same spaces and places with the um, scholars and the scientists um, are having these conversations, right? We have to teach each other and we have to think about these things critically, right? Not just continue to do things like participate in the census without critically thinking about why we're participating in the census and what they are really doing with that information to our advantage or disadvantage. So with that, Whitney, can you talk to us a little bit about, you know, how does this issue of racial categorization impact you in, in your life? Do you have any examples that you can share with us? <clears throat> um, actually, I really, to be honest with you guys, I didn't really think too much about it at, uh, at first, but now I, I am. And um, I started thinking more about it after I became pregnant with my, my first child and I became a parent myself. And uh, that's why one of my concerns was about um, the healthcare system. And um, you kind of, someone kind of spoke about it, about how um, um, communities of color you know, how we're basically looked at and treated in the healthcare system. So uh, given an example, my son got severely sick uh, when he was probably like 16 months old. I kept bringing him back and forth to the hospital and the doctors there were basically kind of just somewhat laughing at me and basically saying that he's just dehydrated. I did have a cousin uh, on this third day. I had a cousin, I called him, he's a pediatrician, and he was able to tell me over the phone what um, my son's symptoms sounded like. So I advocated for my son, got in contact with the patient advocacy of the hospital, and then got my son transported to ICU. And from that point on, I just knew that I, like, I, I'm, me being a parent, I'm going to have to advocate for my son. And, um, and just parents in general, because, um, I mean, he could they told me if I wouldn't have brought him there that he could have had a heart attack and like I said my son was about 15 16 months old and could have had a heart attack so that was one of my first kind of scary experiences with the healthcare system and then being a first time parent and um then um getting talked into uh cesarean sections that I probably didn't necessarily need it was just just a lot. And then leaving the hospital after having major surgery, um, a cesarean section, I mean, basically your organs are basically, you know, moved around and stuff and then giving ibuprofen. Like it's just, you know, so that that's just kind of been my personal experience with um, as far as like the healthcare and kind of looked at as, you know, we're um, 
kind of looked at it as being able to tolerate more pain and deal with things a little bit more and not taking that seriously. And um, my son's life almost uh, was at risk because of that. Yeah, yeah. I think one of the major issues, as we all know, is Black infant and maternal health. And uh, what social scientists and others have come to determine is that the correlation of racism with Black infant and maternal health outcomes is pretty strong, right? It doesn't matter how much money we make or how much education we have or what zip code we live in. We still end up with really poor health outcomes as Black mothers uh, with our Black babies, right? right? And so the issue comes up when you're being taken care of, even if you're not being seen, if they pull it up and they say, oh, here's a mother who says her son's experiencing these symptoms, and then it says Black, Black mother with a Black son, it's like, oh, she's overreacting, mm -hmm. right? He's fine. Right. He's going to be fine. With the difference of if that wasn't there, what might have been the response, right, to your needs if it weren't for this idea of categorization? And really what categorization supports is racist ideas, right? And that's why we're having this conversation today at, at a systemic level to say we can't talk about ending racism if we continue to feed into this idea of these racial categories that are continuing to support people's uh, biases, especially as it relates to our, our health outcomes. Um, so as you continue to listen to, to this conversation today, Whitney, were there other things that came up for you? Um, uh, his name, uh, Dr. Davis, uh, was, no, no. Dr. David Hayes Bautista? Yes, when he kind of spoke about um, the whole uh, beginning of the census and um, with the blood of the Latino or stuff, and then I'm thinking like, well, it's Black Latinos, so how do you kind of, I don't know, it, how do you differentiate <laughs> that? Like, what do you, you know, so that kind of was something that... Um, was brought up to me because the person could be want to identify themselves as Latino. They it, it, from uh, Mexico, from wherever, and then um, but then they're told here that going by what they look like, that that's not what they are. So you're black, and that's just what you are. You're African American. That's what you are. So that was kind of interesting to me. I never really thought about it in in that light or looked at it in that way. Mm -hmm. And, you know, based on some of what, again, you know, um, you're hearing today, because this is part of our goal is to continue to have these dialogues and to really hear from the folks who are who are with us today. We're going to, you know, have a, an open conversation here in, in just a little bit when we close out. But to better understand how can we connect, right, Whitney, how do we connect with you know, moms and, and other community members like yourself who aren't listening to this information every day, you know, who may um, really believe that uh, a lot of this information um, that we're hearing, you know, might even be questionable, right? You know, saying, well, what do you mean the census uh, may not be a great idea? You know, what's going to happen if we don't use the census? You know, are we going to lose our resources or things like that. These are real concerns, right? These are real issues that we've talked about for decades, um, you know, uh, when it comes down to collecting uh, that information through the census and having really our communities be, um, you know, leaned upon um, a lot to collect that data. I know it goes for voting, right? There's all these different examples. Um, what, how, how might you enter that type of conversation with someone now that you, you've heard all of this? <clears throat> how would I enter into the conversation? Um, I, I, I just use my uh, situation as an example, uh, you know, since I'm with the health care and stuff like that. Now, my entire time that I was pregnant with my son, I did not get in um, connected with um, a home visitation program until uh, my last month of pregnancy. So 
I really didn't know too much. First time mom, you're getting information or suggestions from everybody at that point. You don't know what is what. So um, I think a very good way in connecting with the community is connecting with um, home visitation programs that work with parents from the time that they're pregnant until their child is five years old. And um, so I started getting connected with my home visitation program. Um, she started coming to my house when my son was three months old on up until he was five. And that kind of was the spark in me being able to learn how to, you know, use my voice and advocate for my son. So that way right there is a good way to connect with the community. Um, the parents always looking for any kind of information that is going to, you know, help their child. And um, yeah, I think that that right there, it, it should be a, a start is being able to connect with organizations like that, that are more hands on you know, with the people, with the community. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That makes a lot of sense, similar to how we work with our community health workers. Right, how we work with our community health workers and um, yeah, how we work with, with the community health workers and stuff. They are in the, and somewhat of what I do, I'm a community navigator. I connect uh, the community to resources or uh everything and um maybe in that way uh conversation or connecting people with that that's another way to connect we're we're at the events we're at the schools we're on the ground basically with that mm -hmm. absolutely yeah i think it's it is a difficult conversation to have you know when uh i know certainly personally for me as well i've been told um all my life that you know fill out and let everybody know, you know, that you're black so that you can get benefits so that you can get this, you can get that. But then I look around at my communities and I'm like, I don't know if this is working quite the way <laughs> everybody keeps saying it's supposed to work. Um, and then when you look historically, right, the more that we are categorized, it doesn't seem like there's this huge fountain of benefits uh, that is equalizing right our our access to food and health care and and these other services and so it really does i think i think it's important that we that we start to ask these questions and and push back i think is is where we're getting to right to push back on um how we have been told to identify ourselves right and and to think about are we really benefiting you know are we really benefiting from these things? Right, and um, going back to that with um, as far as food and stuff and, um, you know, making sure that you're... She can participate. <laughs> we got to start young. But it's like, okay, so when you look at certain things, you look at... Um, you know, the um, the health of your community and, you know, with the diabetes, high blood pressure, just all these different things. And then you look around what's in your community. Why is it here and not, you know, anywhere else? So that kind of makes you want to uh, connect those dots with that girl here is not cold. So <laughs> sorry about that. But um yeah, so even going back as far as that, like, you know, like how you were saying, um, is this really working? Are we getting the benefits we need? Or is the information being used to um, put things in a community that we don't necessarily need? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. And when we get into larger conversations around, um, you know, why is there no Trader Joe's is a great one, right? And I met with Trader Joe's about 10 years ago and ask them the same question. And the response was, well, you know, it's not our demographic. Well, where do they get demographic information, right? And so that's an example of decisions being made based on the data that they're provided, right? About who we are and, you know, what our, and what our needs are, or what our potential is um, in terms of what types of businesses, you know, come into our communities. Uh, so, you know, a lot, a lot to think about, 
a lot to think about. But um, thank you so much, Whitney, for you know taking time to jump into this conversation you know with us today, and uh, for all the work that you're continuing to do to represent and advocate uh, for your community. And uh, I see your your aunt is Tony Perry. She's a mayor uh, in Arkansas. So thank you, Aunt Tony and Mayor Perry for joining us. Proud to have you on here with us today. And, um, and Anissa had some great uh, comments there. Um, again, even if it's not there on the medical record, they will still discriminate based on how you look. And I don't know how we capture that, the discrimination she faced, if we don't list the racial construct that's been put upon her. I feel like all of us would like to be seen as human beings, but this country has decided to categorize us and treat us differently. And how do we illustrate the harms done if we don't have data showing those harms? Thank you, Anissa. That is the dilemma uh, that we find ourselves in, um, but we are committed to not being lazy, right? We can find solutions uh, to these problems um, and create systems that work better for us in terms of these types of categorizations, right? How do we unwind ourselves from the myth of race, um, but still demonstrate the disparities that are enacted upon us, right? So with that, uh, we're going to jump back over to uh, Dr. Popejoy. She's got uh, a few more slides to share with us, a couple more questions. And then we're just going to spend the rest of the time, you know, with an open conversation for for anyone else who'd like to to chat a bit more. Thank you, Michelle. And yes, most of my slides from now on are just talking to you about. Whoops, don't know what happened there. Sorry. Ah. Um. So I have questions and and prompts for you for for Paul Every and for the for the discussion. But, um, I you know I wanted to just ground what I said earlier in that I'm doing methods development research. Specifically, I'm interested in this question of what would happen if people were allowed to self-identify, truly self-identify using their own words and their own languages. Um, so how might you self-identify if given the option to fill in a blank? If you'd be willing, and we did have, uh, did we want to do breakouts or just stay in the lunch? I think we can stay together. Okay, so um, so please, if you would uh, indulge me again, um, go to the, uh, it should be active right now. It's saying it's not active, but it should be. If someone could just let me know um, uh, when this is, if it's showing up here, there we go. So you should be able to go to the QR code here and then answer a few questions. So either take a picture with your phone, it's the same, it should be the same session. Um, and just answer the, the following questions, which are, um, you know, how do you personally identify on the basis of sex, gender, race, ethnicity, ancestry? Um, and then which which type of question do you prefer to answer? Is it the, the checkbox, like the OMB categories or the fill in the blank? So we'll give folks a couple of minutes to, to fill that out. And then um, when people wanna share, really the question we have is, which which type of question do you want to answer and 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 why? Let me refresh. So are we supposed to be answering the uh, the poll? Okay, some folks are. Yeah. Oh, there it is. Yes, it's working. Sorry. Okay. I got Sorry. it. I'll leave it on this slide. Oh, it's only one. So it's one question and then you go to the next one. You should be able to submit and then go to the next. Yeah, we'll do it too, I'll see.
Right. So in case you're confused, like I am on this, because you can submit more than one response, you have to go up to the blue button that says next to get to the next question. So once you've submitted once, just go ahead to the next one. Thank you everyone for taking time to do this. Dr. Popejoy actually aggregates and collects uh, this data um, in most of uh, the presentations she does. And I shall shortly kind of show you a little bit of a map um, which demonstrates what she is doing, you know, with the data that you are so kind enough to share with us. Yes, okay. So it looks like four people are all the way done, 10 are still underway. If you would um, just be so kind as to continue those as you can, and I'll talk about the research that I'm trying to do, well, that I'm doing and uh, and I'm getting slowly getting my lab started my second year as a professor at UC Davis. So we're we're um, we're we're building this from scratch, and it's um, it's going going well so far. But the basic idea is that we have these categories here, and we have yes no to each of the categories, and that's the data structure. This is how we capture the information, how we hold it in our computer databases, and how we use uh, the information to do research. Um, so what I propose is that instead of having people represented as little tick marks or check marks next to a box binary, yes, no, do you fit this category, that you actually allow people to put in whatever they want. And then you have structured questions that then create these um, multi-dimensional maps of information about an individual. So something that we've um, that we've developed is Abhishek or Abi uh, Chozan, who has built the um, the sort of interface for this. Uh, you can go around and you can play with this. It's at demographmap.com, and this is a hundred thousand individuals from the National Marrow Donor Program database with um, open-ended questions uh, or open-ended responses, as well as categorical responses to the OMB census categories, as well as to questions about ancestry. And you can play in this this uh there we go yeah um this may or may not be live or working for you but um the basic idea is that we want to build a data structure that enables us to efficiently uh keep keep information about what people said and how they self-identified in their own words and language without inferring or making any assumptions about how they might check a box so we would ask we ask both the questions how do you identify in a box? And by the way, you're not going to show up uh, in a in a public uh, map like this um, unless we get explicit permission um, to do that or or to include it in research. This is all just sort of preliminary data. So uh, you may have seen already uh, the next question that I have is, you know, would you support the idea, the, just the basic idea of using this approach to open ended. Um, categorization or, or open-ended identification as opposed to the, the state. So I see some people have responded. I don't know how many this is. So it could be, you know, a few, uh, um, it's just the percentages here that are showing us, but so far nobody said no. So that's a good sign. This is another reason why um, I, it's really important to me to talk to community boards and do outreach um, because I think it's really important um, for me as a researcher to to do a, a a check to make sure that what we're what we're developing is always aligned with um, with what people want and need. As I mentioned, so that's good. Um, and I would, I would just ask you to share. You know, in what circumstances would you feel comfortable um, answering these types of open-ended questions about your identity, as opposed to multiple choice? May or maybe circumstances. Some of you said it depends. So when, when, and under under what circumstances um, would you be willing to to answer this type of question in lieu of or in addition to multiple choice?
seeing a comment in the chat, the open-ended option would also mean that we need to promote qualitative research and data gathering than the traditional quantitative data collection methods. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Diana, did you want to elaborate on that verbally or? Um, I, I, I just think that it, it, that would create a challenge because uh, I think in, in, in epidemiology in a lot of data, uh, reporting, we're so used to the method of categorizing data by, by these standardized racemicity, and we have policies and procedures and standards. And, you know, how do we then tell the stories when we have these open-ended options? And, and that's something that I think that it's worth exploring, because if we're telling people that now you have open-ended options, and then epidemiologists or data scientists behind the, the scene are frantically trying to, you know, recategorize these open-ended options, then I feel like we're just kind of wasting our time. And I think what we really should promote is tell the stories then from a qualitative way, honoring these open-ended responses. And, and I just don't know yet. I just don't know how we would do that in terms of when you read a report, all of a sudden instead of tables, you have all of these open-ended people, uh, open-ended responses from people describing who they are, right? Yes. Yes, absolutely. I think that's right on the right on the money. And, um, you know, the, the demographic table, I think, is one of the worst things that's happened to human research ever, because it's a you require that people live in a row of a table, right, that they live in this row and not that row. And if you live in more than one row, it's a problem for the calculation at the end of the table where the numbers go. So you go in a row that says other or two or more right? That's a big problem. And it's, you're right, it's so fundamental to the way that we track things, the way that we do policies. So that's why I'm working on the fundamental data structures, because I think there's a new way. And spoiler alert, I've been doing a lot of research in um, ancient geometry. So I think there's some geometry that can help us do better than, than tables and statistics. Um, so if we're looking at new qualitative methods to honor, as you said, the narratives that people have about their identities. And I think this is what Dr. Hayes Batista's work is about, um, is, is that, that, you know, there are these narratives uh, in identities that are much more accurate and richer than, than we can um, know in the way we currently do research. So thanks for that. Um, so I have another this is sort of the final formal question, and that is, in what circumstances would you not feel comfortable answering open-ended questions about your identity as opposed to multiple choice? Because maybe there are some circumstances, maybe not, but just wanted to find out. And I think while, while folks are answering that as well, um, you know, we talk about the census and, uh, and then the other example is gerrymandering, right? You know, in, unfortunately, um, our information uh, and our demographics are used to redraw maps um, and concentrate, you know, our communities in a way that it does not benefit us if we do not feel represented um, by our, you know, local or state or national legislatures. And so that is, again, another area where it doesn't, it's questionable. Um, about how this information gets used and to whose advantage. Unsure depends on how information is used. Isn't that isn't that the crux, right? And I think we're in a situation now with the acceleration of AI technologies where I think this is a, somewhat of an unknown at this point, right? Like before we could sort of say, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll make sure that the information is kept in our silo here and there. And there are certain ways that we can still do that. Um, but, but by and large, especially if things are going to a company and we don't know who's going to buy the company or if it's going to be an AI that buys the company and then spreads the data wherever, I think it's harder and harder to know how our information is going to be used, even and especially in the medical system. So I think it's fair to be concerned about the, the downstream uses of data and 
given that we may not be able to tell or to know in advance how something might be used, what information would we be okay with being just out there? I think that's another point to consider is that if if we just accept that nothing, none of our data is going to be private for very much longer with the acceleration of AI, which is a potential feature, that's my personal view. Um, what information would we like the AI to have about us? Do we want them to see us as a box or would we like the AI to know us as a narrative and as something more complicated? I don't know. When you don't know the next step with the data is when you wouldn't feel comfortable. Interesting, yeah. If it doesn't help tell the black story, if me putting an open-ended response makes my data go off in a corner by itself, I'm not going to be open-ended. Fair enough. Yeah. Thank you so much for these. Okay, so the rest of the, the questions that I have here, um, I'm not going to collect data on, just uh, propose them, throw them out there, and we can either address them or not, or have just an open-ended discussion. But the questions I have in general are, um, what questions or concerns do you have about this new potential way of mapping diversity? What type of information would you be willing to share with whom and for what purposes? And then how might this new method um, uh, impact you as individual and or a member of your community? So happy to keep these up or take them down and we can have any any type of discussion or questions that folks want. Well, why don't you take it down and you can drop those questions in the chat um, okay. if you want, uh, Alice. And you know, we just have a, a few more minutes left. And so, you know, happy to hear responses to those questions or any other, you know, thoughts or questions or comments folks may have. I just seen a hand. Who was that? Dr. Blair Lewis. So thank you. And again, I'm sorry that I arrived late. But I, I guess in response to that first question, I guess for me, the issue is that you're um, creating a smaller number of experts in the sense that you're relying on fewer people to tell the story and to interpret. And so how quickly do you diffuse competency such that, again, people aren't getting rewarded with what, for what they already know? And so you're not exacerbating a gaps that already exist in terms of, again, whose voices matter. Uh, Dr. Blair-Lewis, can you give an example of that for us? So uh, again, I'm I'm an academic, and I know that we get invited into rooms because of the expertise that we have, right? And so if we're saying that this mapping is going to be the new standard, then the only people that get invited initially are the people that already have the competency. And so how do you fast track competency development such that, again, you're not rewarding people, again, again, creating additional disadvantage because, again, people have to have time to catch up. So is this a question of who's going to have access to the technology or to the method itself and then making sure that that's really accessible? So it's a, it's that and, again, because I for me, the, the questions that I was having in terms of open-ended, you know, is, is what's next because um, I understand the desire not to put people in a box. Um, but anytime you develop a standard or a language, there has to be someone that's helping with the interpretation. And so right now, you know, the early, the early adopters have the advantage in that space. And so how do you kind of close that gap? Uh, so that if it is about leveling and giving kind of equal access, how do you kind of expedite that? Yeah, that's a great question. Something we've been thinking about as well as sort of crowdsourcing interpretation. So bringing the interpretation questions back to individual community members who've given their responses, almost like a bi-directional conversation to have citizen scientists being lifted up. But that's that's for a future conversation. Um, but I mean, we would love to hear folks' thoughts on how involved or not people would like to be in, in the development of this type of work. Mm -hmm. Do you want something delivered, already accessible and ready to use, or do you want to be involved in the process of development and in, in innovating in this space? I, I want to generalize from an N of one. 
and basically say again, I um, I think uh, having my voice involved sooner rather than later is always my preferred strategy. I'd rather be involved in terms of the building than the blessing of it once it's built. And so, um, and again, I, I recognize that that's, uh, that again, it's personal, but I think that the issue is, have we created the space for people to actually have the choice? I had the train already left the station. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Blair Lewis. I think, you know, this is a really complex issue um, to say the least. Uh, every time we have these discussions, uh, it's a rabbit hole, and there are a lot more questions uh, than we currently have answers for. Um, but you know what I hope we have done today is spur some critical thinking, right? And that's our goal: is if we're going to interrupt and disrupt the systems in which we know are causing us harm, then we have to have these difficult conversations in which we may not have all the answers, but it's really important that we keep asking the questions, right? And our goal in this is to actually, as you can see, involve the community in this. Um, our organization, Rising Communities, will be working with uh, UC Davis, Dr. Pope Joy, Dr. David Hayes Bautista, Dr. Michael Udell to do a couple of things. One is we wanna launch a consortium um, around this topic and invite whether they're citizen scientists um, or other scholars who may have already been working in this space. There's actually quite a bit published out there on this topic from a lot of scholars and scientists of color um, who have long been concerned about racial categorization in this country um, and invite them you know, to continue lifting up you know, their questions and their thoughts and their criticisms so that we can move towards um, a better solution for all of us. And, and that absolutely does have to start uh, collectively. Um, and it does need to be a mainstream effort, not just something that's happening at the levels of academia or the National Academies of Science. Uh, so uh, with that, I'm gonna uh, turn to um, Dr. Udell and uh, Dr. David Hayes Bautista is there uh, any kind of closing thoughts you'd like to have? Uh, I think Alice and I have had the, uh, the stage for a little while here. So I wanna give you guys an opportunity for any closing thoughts. Well, I, I think this issue of community involvement is really important or what I call the subaltern racial narrative, even of us in academia, we have had our racial narrative rejected over and over. And, Remember, we had to go on strike in 1969 at Berkeley just to get ethnic studies, which is always considered something political rather than part of the basic scientific enterprise. And I'm a scientist from day one, but dang it, we need to have our voices and our narratives as part of the uh, research enterprise. So yes, this is a good step in that way. I'm really enjoying this. Thank you, David. Michael? Yeah, and, and just to say thanks for a great discussion. I loved hearing my colleagues talk uh, and also to everyone on the call. Um, I, I think the challenge for all of us is, you know, how do we continue these types of discussions and how do we make meaning from them and translate them into the kinds of, you know, opera, op, opera, operationalization of these ideas in, 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 in science and medicine, because we're, we're we're far away from that right now. Um, and it's going to take some time, but it's also going to take a lot of effort. So thank you. And thank, thank you. you, Michelle, for pulling this all together. Uh, you've been a champion of all of us. And I know you, you are both of and not of academia. Um, and you straddle the two worlds. And uh, we are we are grateful for your leadership and, and thoughtfulness. Thank you, Michael. I appreciate it. And um, and then Whitney, actually, are you still with us, Whitney? I know you're juggling a lot. No, I just got kicked out, and then now I'll just log back on. But I'm here. Okay. I wanted to say any any closing thoughts for us. Um, closing thoughts. No, not really closing thoughts. The only thing I will have to say is that uh, yeah, this 
conversation does um once you start to talk about it and ask these questions it, it, you can ask a thousand questions because then you get into the whole um as far as like these open uh open-ended questions and stuff and go on and on and on because okay i'm black but are you're african-american but are should i be able to say I'm Black American or just all kind of, you know, things and issues and stuff with that. I mean, given the fact that my ancestors, you know, helped building of this, of this country, you know, it, it can just go many, many different ways. So I most definitely think that um, this is a conversation to, to be had and more people in the community needs to, you know, get into the conversation. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you, uh, Dr. Burden, Michelle, for inviting me on. Awesome. Thank you so much, Whitney. And I just want to thank everyone who joined us today. Uh, we will uh, be posting this to the YouTube. So and we'll send the link out to you all so you can you know, share it uh, widely, hopefully. And as we continue to have these conversations in community, we will be you know, letting you all know, hopefully, um, if anybody even wants to uh, volunteer to host a conversation, we'd be happy to support you in that. Feel free to reach out to us at any time. Uh, and just thank you again to all of our esteemed panelists and speakers. Just really appreciate all of the time and effort and lifelong commitment uh, that you've had to these issues. So thank you all so much. Thank you.